welcome. It's great being here again at BI. And um, you know, what's good about presenting in the afternoon is that the, the last session right after lunch was the one you were all supposed to take a nap during. <laughs> you got your nap since, now you're invigorated. But also that you have a lot of theoretical background about chronic pain, is that correct? <laughs> Already? Good, so I don't have to start with that. Um, so this, this has a rather unruly title and so many nouns. Creativity, music therapy, improvisation, and something else. There's another word in there that's kind of new today. What is it? Reflection. Reflection. What are these things doing together? Well, pretty much like everyone else here, um, I don't know if you've noticed this, but everybody here is developing a new method. Have you noticed that? Each person has their own stick in a way. So this is another shtick. And if you notice, most of, and so part of what I'm going to be presenting about is how people develop their shticks having to do with chronic pain. So you can speak a little Yiddish when you're in New York. <laughs> <laughs> Without being a shlemiel. <laughs> so, um, that was the wrong word. I wouldn't read a shlemiel. It would be more of a shlemiel. Yeah. Okay. That's the guy who something, the schmuck pushes the shlemiel and spills something onto the shlemazel. <laughs> okay, good. So, if you notice, a lot of these methods that people are talking about or approaches are compilations of things we already do in music therapy. Correct? But, the, the, cre the creative and helpful part is they, they combine them differently or they emphasize one aspect of one method or approach or perspective, okay? <laughs> and that's pretty much what this is today, uh, this afternoon. Um, somehow, we're gonna be looking at a relationship between all of these things here, creativity, um, music therapy, improvisation specifically, and this word reflection and reducing the pain experience. I think this is the first time that I've seen on this program the term pain experience is taking place, uh, that's going on. So we're going to be talking about what that means as well, okay? So here's one of the problems we have in music therapy. We tried working that. Um, and by the way, um, the, uh, it's not really clear what the exact mechanisms are for pain reduction, okay? So we don't really know how pain reduction works. That's not my thought, okay? That's part of the data. You can't have members this morning here saying things like, you can't have opinions about facts, okay? Well, we, the mechanisms aren't known. Also, the mechanisms of music therapy aren't known. So this comes, this statement, that I'll have you read while I'm interrupting you, <laughs> uh, comes from an interesting article written by a psychiatrist about music therapists in a drug rehab facility. Um, and they're speaking about it, the way you look on a, um, on a medicine uh, you know, directions, the exact mechanisms are unknown. You ever see that? Mm -hmm. on, your, on your medicine, you know, if you look at any of the neuroleptic, not yours necessarily, uh, the antipsychotic medications, <coughs> they say the exact mechanisms are unknown. Okay. Well, the side effects scare the heck out of you on TV. They know how those happen. <laughs> okay. uh, but it's un so it's unclear which is it in music therapy. Is it the passive, you know, just listening to music? Is it active participation in creating music? Is it the connectivity or the group cohesion? Uh, is it the pleasure in successfully <coughs> creating things together? Is it the relationship to the music therapist or some other non-specific group process? What, what is it that does the trick in music therapy? I mean, we heard Yoko earlier talking about um, how Tony um, uh, creates a greater body awareness and it's neuroscientifically demonstrated. That's a good point. Uh, that, but we still don't know how that, what that has to do with pain reduction, right? It's not, it's no slur against anybody, we, and it's not our fault. We don't, nobody knows the mechanisms, okay? But does anyone know uh, at least one theory of pain reduction? The gate? Yeah, sure, the gate control theory with Melzack and what was the other guy's name? I don't remember. In the 60s. That's still the current model for understanding how pain reduction works. Um, and what does that mean? Well, the exact mechanisms are unknown. But, but it basically it means that, a mess, that we can only really focus on one major stimulus at a time. Okay? And then everything, this is why multitasking just doesn't work. And everything else goes into the background. So we have a figure ground relationship. Um, and you notice this, everyone here has had, had to deal with pain. And sometimes you found something that temporarily relieved you of the pain, non-pharmaceutical. And that's because something else was a more powerful signal to you that that replaced the pain message. And we can only have one major message going on. So the pain goes into the background. And what you were attending to comes into the foreground. 
that's the, the theory of gate control. Specifically, neurons in the brainstem and um, upper spinal cord um, send out messages to inhibit receiving the pain signal to the spinal cord when they are told to do so. Are you saying it's successful reversion? No. I was waiting for someone to say That's that. What I'm Thank you. Here's your pay. Get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, it's not, it's not a diversion. Not a diversion. Here's why. And we're going to get to this. But let me, let me get to that a little bit later. Okay. Diversion is a clown or someone going, boom. Right? But when you're involved with a heavily affective experience, it turns out that the more positive emotions, specifically positive emotions we're going to be getting to, um, I hope all of us get to them, um, the positive emotions override the pain signal more powerfully and separately than um, distraction, which is what that, that's officially called in medicine. Okay. Uh, and there's been studies where they've taken, they've used distraction methods and they've used uh, um, the same kind of cognitive processes that go on with certain types of music, and then they would take highly preferred or beautiful music for people, and it was a different process with greater pain reduction. That's pretty recent, but I can't spend a lot of time on this right now. I call we use the word diversion. Yes, well, in the literature, it's distraction. No, no, what, what you're saying, more accurately. Well, affective, positive affect experiences. But we're going to get to this okay. sequentially. More questions. I mean, start, yes. I have a chronic, I'm a psychologist, long history. You're a chronic psychologist, okay? Right. Long history of, of being a psychologist. And recently honed down my practice, and I have a chronic pain syndrome for 10 years. But I love my patients, and I love listening doing in intake, uh -huh. and when I sit down with my patient and I have a new thing and I'm listening to them and I'm all involved, my pain goes like on the back burner. I can pay attention to it in a second. I can, I can distract, I can just not listen. You gave us and a I, clue. And it's there, but then when I'm in with my patient, I like my patients, I don't even remember. Three clues, did you hear them? Mm -hmm. One, heavily involved, mm -hmm. strong signal neurologically, really likes her people. Mm -hmm. Thank goodness. Imagine if you hated them. Okay. <laughs> All right. So these are two clues to what we're going to today. So I asked this question. What's your name? Abreen Brand. Abreen? Abreen. Abreen. Well, let's, let's look at that. Is it possible to set something up? See, I hate PowerPoints. You're always in someone's way. Um, <laughs> is it possible that some of the therapeutic mechanisms we saw in that last slide uh, can be more effective for a particular type of patient than another. I haven't heard anyone yet speak about the mechanisms or even their theory about how music therapy works for pain reduction, including you on NPR. Um, <laughs> have you heard M Andrew on the great M NPR Science Friday? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Thank you. So I think the is great. Um, so if we could, maybe some of these therapeutic mechanisms of all those things we saw in music therapy. Maybe some of them are more important for some patients with some problems than others, okay? Um, and maybe is it possible to structure a therapy toward something that would give you a scientific, that would give you a specific therapeutic response by encouraging, here's now, this is a little different, by encouraging the patient to um, toward some of the processes over others. So instead of having, uh, you'll notice some music therapists keep it really free and open, let's you know, improvise and do this in tone. Where we work, uh, and my students are in a you know, ma uh, major hospital, Hahnemann University Hospital in Philadelphia, right next door to our music therapy program. Um, you may not see the patient more than twice, okay? So you, pr and you, you pretty much have to cut to the chase. They don't have a lot of energy. These are, these are oncology adults, many of them are elderly, and they have a lot of pain. They don't have a lot of time, you know, in terms of uh, an hour an hour of a session or something like that. They're, they're tired. So is there a way you can streamline things that seem to work for pain reduction and focus just on those and bring the patient to that mindset with you? That sounds like it'd be a good idea, doesn't it? Yes. Well, it works. Yeah. Okay, so here's how. First, we have to inflict chronic pain on you. <laughs> no, I'm here. I'm, by the way, I'm, I, was, I was not joking about um, the after lunch sleeping. That's why I'm cracking jokes. I see your head's good. I'm going to crack a joke and then leave that. <laughs> okay. So here's the, uh, let's look at some of these things we talked about. We looked at uh, passive listening is a type of music therapy. 
Um, and the, the Cochrane report on that says it's not, it doesn't work that well. Just listening to music. You don't know if you saw the joke in The New Yorker. Uh, it looks like a psychiatrist at a desk on the phone. He says, look, just sing I Gotta Be Me a few times and call me in the morning. <laughs> so passive listening by itself isn't that effective. It might work for this person when they hear Claire de Lune, okay? And it might work for this person when they hear something novel or some new age thing, but I doubt it, okay? Um, but on the whole, the research isn't that good about passive listening, okay? So we have to get rid of that idea. If we're trying to streamline something to take the, the most valuable aspects of certain music therapy methods that seem to help people with chronic pain and put them together, okay? Does that make sense what, where we're going with this? Mm -hmm. It's against a lot of orthodox music therapists who believe that you really have to start from, you know, this big open warm-up and this kind of... So this is different and it's going to be a little controversial, okay? But it comes from experience. And, and we're actually going to be doing a study on this soon, look, uh, soon looking at... Soon, that's a nice gift. Um, <laughs> looking at cortisol measures. So, um, creativity. Okay, why is creativity part of this method? Isn't creativity in all of these things? <coughs> yes, but people don't focus on it. Music therapists don't know a lot about creativity. And they don't know how to, um, how to bring a patient, a lot of them do, believe me, but to bring a patient, and use this very direct terms like this, into an experience where they're being creative. Why is creativity helpful? I'll let you read that, and then you tell me during the quiz. So this is some data. So creativity sounds like a good idea. Um, and there's other reasons. When somebody is creative, uh, when we talk about the pain experience, um, we'll see why, how creativity challenges that and upsets the, crane ex the create, uh, pain experience. We want, um, okay. And this is all data. This is, uh, these are from research studies. Even though some of them sound flowery, they're all from research studies. Luke Richards is a great writer about everyday creativity, the kind that's evenly distributed across the population. So when someone says to you, oh, I'm not a creative type, I can't do this, they're thinking eminent creativity. They're thinking the masters, okay? But everyday creativity is basically problem solving. Or, Problem finding, even more fun. Sometimes we create the problem on purpose. Okay. Now, let me see. I'm making this recipe, but I don't want to use sugar. What can I use? Sugar. That's sugar. It's Glenda. Okay. We, that's an example. Okay. And you try some things. You won't believe what people try, but they don't either. That's why there's no hatred for that story. It's like, it's like low fat um, fried chicken. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're going the other way. So, so what's this reflection stuff? So we know creativity might be a good idea. Let's put something about creativity into this method. What's reflection? Well, there's a lot of literature out about what reflection being different than um, typical verbal processing. When music therapists, maybe others, when we do verbal processing, which is verbal discussion after the improvisation or the music making, its basic purposes are to enhance the patient or client awareness about what happened and allow them an opportunity to, to use cognitive ways, verbal ways, to own what took place and to maybe see it from another, see themselves from another perspective. Another function is in an individual session is for the therapist to learn a lot about the client. I worked with a man who was seriously mentally ill. We would sit at the piano, he wouldn't talk. Verbal processing is pretty important for a therapist to understand what's going on with the client. And um, he'd play some piano. We were improvising together, pretty free and open improvisation. I liked his melodies. He would make these melodies up that kind of sound like Thelonious Monk, like they'd end on the augmented fourth or something. You know, it was, it was out, but it was so in. Um, but he would just make these things up. And, uh, and he, occasionally he'd, he'd hit his arm, and Lena here's heard, heard this story. He'd, he'd stop playing, go, and then go back to playing. And so I was young in my career, and I said to him, Joey, I noticed that the, you know, during the music, when you were playing, you occasionally smacking your arm. And yes, I get muscle tension there sometimes myself when I'm playing piano. Is that what was happening with you? Stupid me. He said, no. 
I was annihilating my aggressors. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> he had a delusion, to say the least. So it's always, it's always good to ask them what it was like for them, you know, what, what was going on for them. Um, so, so interestingly enough, though, reflection is very different. Um, and there's data about reflection. Resilience is a word we're hearing about. Am I blocking your way chronically? Yes, sorry. Okay. You don't want to read it anyway. No. no. Um, <laughs> we're hearing about resilience, okay? When people do a, a, make a, a, a reflection, and we'll define it in a second, um, all these things really happen. This is from literature. Guess who's using it a lot now? Cognitive behavioral therapists, okay? Um, people who, who use reflection <coughs> on a daily basis uh, have major depressive disorder prognostic changes. Uh, it looks like you're going to recover. Um, it's also active problem solving. But listen, to, I, I like the last bullet with the best. Reflection is an emotional, uh, is a way to modulate emotion. And you can modulate pain through this, this method, through the dissociable neuropsychological mechanisms. What does that mean? It basically means that inhibitory neurons are told to get to work. Okay, it's gate. That last dot is the gate. Okay? <coughs> so reflection can be powerful can be very strong, and we can induce it in a music therapy session, okay? So it's really important we have the client becoming, using their own problem-solving powers to, to for creativity. By the way, if you really <coughs> want to see creativity data and how powerful it is, go to the Pennebacher studies. He was the person who developed the method of um, journaling, um, and he found that not only when people journaled along this you know, pretty open-ended way, not only did they have better health, these were college students, thousands of them. He also did these with the Navy, thousands of people. He did them with IBM employees, two of them. No, no, thousands of them too, okay? So, and what he found was that their health improved. They didn't get the flu as much as their counterparts who were in control groups, okay? And also, they, um, they, had, less, they had less depression, they had less, uh, less moodiness, okay? <coughs> And that's real data, and that was just creative writing, basically. All right, so I don't have to sell you on that one anymore. Um, so if we look at reflection, let me find where my definition is. I have a real nice one here somewhere. Ah. It's, well, as you know, it's sometimes used as a synonym for introspection. But it's a little bit more specific than that. It's thinking about a, a thing, particularly with the notion of meditation upon a previous experience or an event and meditating on its significance. So it's a longer, slower mental process that's going on, right? So uh, we'll, I'll describe how the method is used. It's very similar to a phenomenological type of interview when we um, encourage uh, reflection. All right, so I want to switch gears now and get my high-tech blocker here, gate theory. And we're going to watch TV for a minute, okay? So in this case example, we're going to see a man uh, who has sickle cell uh, anemia, and he's, um, he's in pain a lot. He likes to play a little thumb piano, the kalimba. Okay? And he comes to our hospital as an outpatient quite a bit. You see him walking around the hall sometimes. But he plays in subdivision all the time. No breaths, okay? Um, and he liked that. He's like tension. So this is his little tension meter or something. Um, so when I met with him, you don't get to see this part on the video. But when I met with him, I, I tried to slow down when he was playing by, by playing slower and longer phrases and then shorter phrases. It started to work a little bit. But I asked him before we played, and then we'll do this up here too. I, I, I'm going to make up his name as Bruce because that's his real name and he loves to use it. <laughs> I, said, I said, Bruce, before we, before we play, I'd like you to think about some words about your love for music. Okay? Um, and the words, the adjective that you would use, just for yourself, um, what you would describe happens to you when you're playing the music. And I'd like you to think of that as your musical score, as your notation. And as you're playing music, let those adjectives, those words, guide you. You see, I'm setting him up for two things. This is now a referential improvisation. He has to improvise music about certain thoughts. 
and that's stimulating a creative process. He's taking his thoughts about music and having to make music with them. Okay, so that's that's a problem, isn't it? It's not a heavy problem. That's a problem. And um, and the next thing is I'm also inviting reflection. Okay, so this is in this method we're inducing a mental state. Okay, uh, it's an actual type of a therapist guided affect modulation, and from this. We know that these two um, experiences, creativity, and that can enhance mental health, first of all, and resilience, and second of all, we know that reflection can actually take someone away from their pain. We know that the music can too, but it's not, there's no data right now about using the improvisation method and how it reduces pain. Okay? We know what it does, it's the job of research to, to prove what we know is true. Isn't that a presumptuous New Yorker way of saying it? <laughs> all right. So if you want to get a little bit closer, it's going to be hard to see from way back there, unless it doesn't really matter. But now is your chance if you want to um, move closer, because we have this low-budget TV. Um, yeah, that's better. Who has sickle cell anemia, and he has a lot of pain with this. He found music uh, to be very, very helpful. The pain is something that basically you can't control it. You medicate it. But it actually is uncontrollable. It's more severe at other times than sometimes than others. I've learned different ways to try to deal with it, handle it. We see her walking through the hallway sometimes of the hospital here with us, Kalimba, and she's brain fat, lots of subdivision, with no pauses, and this seems to slow down the pain or therapies have been used for pain management in hospitals and other types of medical settings. We no longer think of pain as simply tissue damage in our response to this, but we also think of pain as the isolation, the distortion of time, the idea that we don't have a role in society anymore when we have pain. We have simply left alone without pain. When Bruce and I played music together, it was a different experience for him than he normally has. I'd like you to listen to this music, not as a critic. I'd like you to try and take some of the words we were using before about peaceful, and as you hear this, let your breathing go with it. See what response you have. All sounds are through the thalamus. Music and other emotional responses go to the hypothalamus, which helps to regulate our hormonal responses. So before the brain is even following the melody, the music is charged, it's already uh, describing the pathway for the emotions. Um, and with that, there's a reduction of the hormones, the stress hormones. So it's very, very rapid. We're getting the pain in the cortical cerebral, which is our stress response. I could actually hear Bruce's pain and he's going to play, and I could hear him take some musical ideas from what we were creating and try something new. And when someone is in that position and they try something new, the pain experience is altered. I think there was a release of a lot of angst, a lot of energy that he'd been holding in. And it was very pleasurable to him. It was very powerful for him to hear that he was a part of something beautiful. If that's the first time you listen to yourself in a long time. And hopefully someone else can see a lot of people. So here's an example of a person who's teaching me this method, okay? He's got to create something here, okay? And then when he speaks about it in a reflecting way, okay? The way you, one way, the best way to encourage reflection is to stay out of the way for the therapist. Don't ask closed-ended questions. How was that for you? Oh, you're yikes, okay. So, um, but he, and a lot of this has been edited. Uh, edited out, but he did describe a lot of the other adjectives he was using and some he didn't even bring up earlier in describing his love for music and how music like that would sound. And he was free of, is free of pain from this. And you know, two other things happen. If we, let's, let's get into the, um, the pain experience part. Did I just make a quick comment? I, I think yeah. another piece that's important to reflection is wisdom. Uh -huh. I mean, it, it seems that the person's kind of uh, stepping back 
back and having a wider view of their, I mean, they're, they're thinking of their experience as an experience. Uh, all this sort of... An aside. Th this, um, all these connections are like snapping and popping right in the moment. And then the, you could tell just from watching him, his eyes, he was like, there's a sense of surprise, but it's almost like something he already knew but never heard himself say. A lot of things happening all at once, mm -hmm. connecting. Yeah, yeah. Other comments or thoughts that you had from um, Bruce's teaching? So just to, to review, you were just saying um, um, not to ask any closed-ended... Yeah, I'm going to get to that in the end, but at home yeah, method, sure, I'll make sure, sure. I'm glad you're interested in that part. Yeah, sure. Did you find out from him um, off the recording of what he was saying thank you to? What you, so you, that was some, one of the first things he started to say once you heard that he heard the playback. It was I didn't ask him that. No, no, I was part of it. I was the witness mm. at that point. Um, so I see that you, you, the guy breaks his pain cycle or does something else with it when he's with you and he's distracted. But what about if he's in pain from eight in the morning to eleven at night? Prescriptive functions. And when he gets to that too, not many people are talking about that in this <laughs> conference yet, huh? That's true. Yeah, so we have to talk about that. I mean, in this hospital, what happens, you know, Andrew sees a patient and has a wonderful experience and the person's free of pain. What happens at four in the morning when the person's free? Mm -hmm. yeah, I know he's not going to come in here. <laughs> they don't pay him enough. All right, so uh, I mentioned the pain experience. This is an important concept. I first learned about this from a man named um, Larry, Larry Dossey. Oddly enough, a cardiologist who was on the faculty of psychiatry at Southern Methodist University. He's a big writer. He was the editor-in-chief of many of the alternative medicine journals. Um, uh, he has several books out, uh, Dossie, D-O-S-S-E-Y. His first big book was called Space, Time, and Medicine. He's not new agey, okay? But he took to some other teachers he's had. This is, this is not a target. Um, the pain experience. When we have pain, it's not just tissue damage, okay? So I'm going to ask you, what are some of the parts of the person's experience when they're in, when they're, when they're in pain? Look at me, perhaps chronic pain. I'll give you one. I'm going to make these vectors. Time. The experience of time is a major part of pain, the pain experience, isn't it? Okay. Give me another one. Uh, limitation in activity. Good. I, mean, I don't mean that's good. That's a good example. Okay. Um, Decrease physical, okay, can I just say that for now? Decrease physical activity? Anxiety? Okay, uh, anxiety is part of something else, uh, which is mood. Mm -hmm. There's mood restrictions. Any illness you have restricts your range of mood, by the way. Okay. Decrease mood. And often the mood is sad. What else is, uh, what are some of the other factors that uh, were limitations that are part of the pain experience? Isolated. Thank you for that one. <laughs> By the way, isolation is a multi-bladed um, sword. Okay. Um, because um, you're isolated from having an impact on the environment. By the way, that's the definition of adaptation. Having be able to, being able to fit together with the environment. Compliance is not adaptation. Conformity is not adaptation. Fitting together with the environment is adaptation. The environment in some way is affected by you in adaptation. Okay, in some way. That happens. That's gone because you're now isolated. You don't leave home. You're, you're physically restricted. Okay, so therefore, if you're isolated, your social role is reduced, right? Imagine a father of six, okay? His social role, his, his role in his family is reduced. Also, his social role is reduced. Anything else? Any other experiences? Inability to concentrate? Yeah, um, actually, believe it or not, I looked that up a lot. That's not one of them. That's not a noticeable one for everybody. Because people get into their work, and then sometimes that's a pain reliever for them in some ways. Yeah, well, that's, I'm going to put that into here. Because they become de independence means others. So their role with others has changed. It's become reduced. So each one of these has a lot of factors in it. Okay? Um, your perception of yourself. Ooh, what happens to your perception of yourself? Self-esteem down. Self-esteem. Yeah. If 
few more, you think? You get the idea, right? So, why is this up here? Because let's call this the pain gestalt, rather than, because these are all parts of it. And here's why it's a gestalt. A gestalt is a whole, and if you change one part of it, it's no longer that. Like if we took off your, say, your head, okay? You wouldn't be the same person anymore, right? Your gestalt was different, okay? Here's another example of a, of a gestalt. That's a bad gestalt. It's incomplete, it causes tension. It's not a circle, is it? Is that a circle? So these things create tension. So it's a bad gestalt now, it's a good gestalt. It's a little accent up there, but you get the idea. All right, so the pain gestalt, what we know, and anyone who's done work with people with pain, you know that if their ch sense of time changes through relaxation methods, that's what happens first, by the way, your sense of time. We've done a few of them here today already. Your sense of time is gone, no longer clock time. You're on a virtual time now. If, so if you, upset, if you upset the homeostasis of this pain gestalt, even through time, through relaxation, the pain is reduced. The pain experience, the pain experience is reduced. Would you agree? Yes. From now on, I'll say the pain experience is altered. Um, by the way, speeding up or slowing down, just getting out of pain time. So there is a pain time. There is a pain isolation. There is a pain roll. Okay, all of these can be preceded by the word pain. So and if you upset any one of these, you've upset the, the uh, pain result. So let's look at what happened with Bruce, okay? We don't know about time. I don't know about that one, okay? But he was in a fast tempo, wasn't he? All right. Um, he talked about not being isolated. He talked about accompaniment, it sounded better. He wants peace for others. He was thinking of other people when he played music, okay? So this has been destroyed, or at least, at least altered. His role, he was part of a duet. We were playing music together. I couldn't have played that, that music without him. And we were basing what we played upon uh, what we basing what we played upon each other or from each other, okay? So his role, the pain role is, is disrupted. His self-perception, he felt peace, okay? He didn't feel peace at other times when he talked to this man. And you see him, he's kind of possessed walking around the hall with this balloon. He sounded a little possessed too, didn't he? Um, so his self-perception is, that the pain self-perception is, is changed. How about his mood? Okay, we can presume that his mood was, was, was all varied from that, okay? So you're getting the idea? When you upset any one of these factors of this pain gestalt, the gestalt is no longer a pain gestalt. You've upset the pain experience. We're not even talking about tissue damage, okay? Or this, or this the ang angularity of the um, hemoglobin cells it's getting blocked in his veins and causing the pain, okay? So keep that in mind. That's why these kinds of concepts, um, we can even say moving someone toward the experience of beauty, okay? And putting them in that position where they're going to be experiencing that in some way. Um, that's gonna upset the pain gestalt because of the, all these factors, first of all. As a matter of fact, other types of music therapy, sometimes we'll, in a group we'll play raucous stuff. We'll play some James Brown or some, um, uh, some really moving uh, blues. Okay, so um, so in the method I'm describing, where you combine, you really focus on creativity, you put a, cre cre a creative ask in there, probably, and then you have an opportunity for music improvisation, and then you um, have an opportunity for reflection. Those are three processes in this. Um, and the purpose of this is to disrupt the um, pain gestalt. <laughs> Not the OG. I was called an OG the other day. Oh. Isn't that a compliment? The, the 17 year old uh, guy in my name means. Oh, say it. No, well, that old geezer. <laughs> I thought it was old guy at first. It means original gangster. <laughs> <laughs> when someone calls you that, they want something from you. <laughs> okay, so um, this process, what we're talking about. Um, we start with orienting the patient, and I'll show you how that goes. Maybe some kind of a warm-up. You don't have to have the warm-up, though. Uh, we'll talk about the pros and cons of this. And we're focusing on everyday creativity, not imminent creativity, everyday creativity. 
and the mastery. What is mastery? It's, it's, it's uh, the release that happens when we realize there's no threat anymore. Okay? So when it starts making sense, when Bruce starts playing and I respond to it, ah, it makes sense. So there may be some anxiety that people won't be able to fit in with what I'm doing. Okay? That's over with. The, the fear is gone, and now the pleasure and the extra energy from that. I think mastery occurs. Try this, music therapist. After you've played music with your group of patients, I'm listening to you and me, ask them afterwards, what's the difference with the way they feel now, at the end of the session, as, a, as compared to when they first came into the room? And I, I, can, I'm, I can honestly say invariably, unless there's a wise guy in the group, invariably you're going to get this kind of answer. I feel more relaxed yet with more energy. Okay? And guess what that is? That's the phenomenological experience of, of mastery. All right. Um, there's tension. You can't have mastery without some tension. Okay. So don't expect mastery from new age music. Why? There's no tension. Okay. I'm joking. Some new age music's just fine. Um, and, and for this method, we're using a referential um, co-improvisation with other people. But a referential meaning the music is meant to refer to something other than just music. We're, and we're adding now this other component of su a supported type of reflection. So um, I'd like to try um, this. Uh, you know, the rest of the PowerPoint's not even that important right now. We know that music induces positive emotions. We know that music can, by itself, reduce pain. All right, we'll get to the rest of the PowerPoint later. So I'd like to have maybe five six people come up and play some music together. If you don't get anything else out of this today, it's going to at least be fun playing music. <laughs> um, number one is that, but I'd like to have one of, one of the people volunteer to be the subject as if this is a one-on-one -on -one session, but the group can still be there. And I'm going to be asking that person to describe their experience in the music. Now, whoever that person is wants to volunteer for that role, it's okay if you if you make up stuff, if something's very personal that happens in the music, you don't want to talk about it, you can talk about, you can give me a false answer, that's okay. All right? So I don't want this to be construed as a therapy session or anything. And we're going to assume everything you say is made up. Okay? So no one's going to like follow you home. You must be the same sign as me. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> so that's for your protection. All right. So let's see how many chairs we can get up here. All right. So we're here now. Good. So um, I'd like to ask the group, uh, what are some words that you would use to describe? And Eric's going to write them up there. This will be our musical score. You don't always have to be looking at it. We'll remember them, a lot of the words. What are some of the words that, you, that this inner circle would describe for uh, music that is maybe beautiful for you, or trans transporting music, or music that is something that really moves you? What's some adjectives you would use for that music? Nice, nice big, yeah, that's it. Yeah, I get that. So I asked them to write on the right hemisphere panel there. <laughs> All right, what's another way? Joy. Another joy, okay. Sensuality. Sensuality. Shh. Sensuality. What's another? Motherly. You know what, just to keep in style with everything else that's been going on here, let's do about one minute of a brief relaxation, okay? All right. So if you do that, we're going to begin. Um, not being encumbered with anything in your hands for now. That's where you get to learn how the relaxation is. It's best if the legs are uncrossed. They don't have to be if you prefer that. And it's best if the eyes are closed. And just take a moment now to 
focus on, well, turn your attention to what your breathing is doing. And please, everyone in the room, follow with us. Take a moment and you'll notice that your mind wanders. So just gently pull your attention back to your breathing and focus on the two movements that happen when you breathe. You breathe in, your stomach and chest rises as your lungs fill up with air. And when you breathe out, your stomach and chest collapses as the air escapes from your lungs through your nostrils. <coughs> Just keep pulling your attention back to those two movements. Breathing in, fill up. Breathing out, collapse. And when your mind wanders, start to notice that your breathing seems to find its own rhythm. You don't have to force it or change it. Just be aware of it. Breathe in, fill up. And when you breathe out, your stomach and chest collapse. Maybe notice the slight pause after you breathe out and before you breathe in again. Again, you don't have to change it or force it. Just be aware of that slight pause. Pulling your attention back. You'll start to notice that your breathing out lasts slightly longer than your breathing in. Don't change it or force it. Just be aware of breathing out. And let's keep our attention on the breathing out process. When you breathe out, allow yourself to give in to your weight so that you feel the support of air. Feel the support that your legs are giving to your arms as your arms rest comfortably there. And give in to the breathing out. Just keep pulling your attention back to that. Giving in to the breathing out. Now I'd like for the musicians to pull your attention back, just the musicians, pull your attention back to Pick up your instrument and be ready to start making some sounds on the drum, making the shh.
bring your attention back to this room. I'm going to ask you, there's a lounge here that I may <coughs> ask some questions or encourage you to be questioned about this. Anybody have any volunteers here? Aquilene. Aquilene. Aquilene, can you tell me what it was like for you to play music now with us? challenging mm -hmm. to be sure I got to do which mm -hmm. we've been dead many shows before but then I decided just to do and it was fun can you tell me about the, the type of fun or what, what, which was the fun for you and the beat was fun uh -huh. um, the trying to listen to other people and be part of them uh, in sync mm -hmm. but do my own thing mm -hmm. was fun and Did you have, um, can you tell anything else about doing your own thing? What, what that was like for you, what that felt like? Um, well, I'm sort of an overachiever, mm -hmm. so I have to do things right. And so what was fun was that I jiggled around with these things, and I decided that everything I did with them was okay, and everybody was doing their thing, and that was really neat. Mm -hmm. Can you, um, I'd like to hear more about what it was like to, to feel a part of the thing with everybody else. Well, there were certain sounds I heard more, like yours, and, and they resonated in my ear at the same time that I was doing my thing. And so the sounds resonating in my ear from other people, um, they were nice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that was pleasant mm -hmm. um, to do my own thing and yet to be part of other sounds coming into my ear. Mm -hmm. you know, I wasn't sure that we all were in sync, but it didn't seem to matter. Mm -hmm. well, I'm going to bring this to a close, okay? But I'm going to use you as an example now, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, I'd like to talk with everybody about what that experience was like. I'm sure you're going to get a lot of responses. But as she spoke, as Aberdeen spoke, did you notice she became animated with her hands? Okay. Did you notice that she had an increased amount of things to say? All right. And did you notice that um, she also spoke a lot about affective or, or feeling kinds of things? You used fun at first, but then you were talking about the sounds around you. And so you were using words like pleasant and you were using maybe one or two words that could have been up there. Okay. Now, um, it's not so much what I did, but I, I encourage you to focus on a few words that you said that seemed positive, okay, doing your own thing, what that was like. Uh, and you mentioned twice um, about being in, in sound with others. So that seemed important to you. So that's why I focused on that. And now if this was a clinical interview where we're doing psychotherapy about her pathological behaviors, there, you know, there are only a few of us know that. Um, I, would, I would ask things like, Avarine, how about those um, obsessive thoughts that you get? Did they come in just now? See, I would focus on that kind of stuff, wouldn't I, being a therapist? I would say things like, did you have those command hallucinations to kill? Okay. Okay. But no, I was focusing on, I asked, and I, I asked her that global question, what was it like to play the music here? Now, if she gets stumped and starts saying the same thing, what I will do is I'll go back, because she doesn't know what's important to talk about. Our patients don't know what's important to tell us, because we ask sometimes dumb, Questions that are closed-ended. That then yes, the <coughs> question. They don't know. They don't know what to volunteer to us. So, um, in this case, always go back if you're using a method like this to invite reflection. Can you? I'd like to hear more about what it was like for you to be in the group just now, okay? Or for you to have this to be to be in the music, you could say, or for you to be playing the music, okay? And I bet you we would get some kind of memory. That was pleasant. I bet you that something else would come up about how she felt in her body. I bet you, but if we keep going back to the, describe more what it was like. Anything, anything at all. Any, you may not think it's important, just describe anything. Then we'll really start to get a sense of what the lived experience was for you, or the essence of it. We'll be getting it. In probably another couple of minutes, we could have gotten even further with that. So thanks for being a volunteer. You're welcome. So we're getting near, right near the end here. 
But does anyone else in the music group here want to describe what that was like? Yeah, I, I was, again, I'm not the music therapist, um, but I have a lot of experience with improvisation, movement and theater improvisation, oh, okay. and I used to teach it. And um, always my thing was to be really intense. I mean, that was just always what I did in the improv group. And um, I don't know if it's age or a lot of years of meditation, but because this was new to me, I just decided to just do really simple things. It's really not what I do. Mm. And then you picking up on it was so encouraging to me. I thought, oh, it's it's his music. He, you know, I, I just felt a tremendous sense of accomplishment with my little choices. Mm -hmm. And definitely, you know, some of you are clearly musicians and you're doing things. Um, just my little contribution, but it really was pleasing to me, the whole thing, and what I was doing. It felt like, you know, in, in the, when I was a little girl in school, like feeling proud of what I just did. So it was very strong for me. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm going to use one thing, she, is, can I use one thing you said oh, and disgrace it all over the tabloids? Yeah. Okay. Um, no. <laughs> um, I, I noticed about the way that Denise was playing. And it was so different from what, how she described herself with improvisation in the past, okay? Um, and this is important for me because it's linked with, with pain, the pain experience, time, okay? So time doesn't only come up with how many notes she's hitting. Um, time can also be extended durationally through sustain. Can you hit this note and just let it ring? She was doing that a lot. She was playing a note and letting it sustain. So I, I would interview, I would encourage her, to, what was that like to, to just let that note ring that you hit it? You hit that note a few times, and I noticed you just let it sustain. And it's delight, it was surprise. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have to reach in between the sheets in order to observe what it was doing. Just that note. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I could continue with this. This is a reflection now, isn't this? I'm not getting data from us. So I'm a okay, this is, um, there goes the whole effect right now, right? I'm going to get a bill of the mail. <laughs> One of the instruments came off. <laughs> so um, the idea that, that, that people want to speak about this, but they don't know what's important to talk about. And of course, in the patient, therapist, and I consider people in a hospital to be patients, not clients. But when I'm in the hospital, I don't want to be a client. <laughs> okay. Different code of ethics. Um, or a provider. Yeah, or yeah, right. or a consumer. Um, <laughs> but um, people in the, you know people in a hospital they have a regressed experience. They're in a bed. You want to regress, lie down. Okay, that's how you regress. Number two is they're in a you know there's a power dynamic there. I'm the therapist, right? The doctor told me to work with this person. So they, so they don't know what to say, say to us. It's not like they're having a normal conversation with their friend Millie you know, on the phone or their sister or their spouse. So if we encourage this open-ended, what was it like? Can you, and can you speak more about that? Or oh, I'd like to hear more about this. Then you will get what's important to them. What was, it was just, you see the smile on her face? And she said, it was great. I didn't have to do any of this. Okay, what a relief. Okay. Oh, I didn't know that about her. I might have interpreted being, you know, we music therapists tend to pathogize things a little bit too much. I would have, you know, I could have said, oh, she's not sure of herself. She has a low self-esteem, and she's only playing notes because she's afraid of messing up. Little did I know until she told me that she was having delight in letting this note sustain within the group music sound here, and what a terrific sound that was, and a nice experience, and less responsibility, and she heard resonance. That's the opposite of, she's not sure of herself, self-esteem issue, okay, right? Came from her. Just quickly, when I realized my own impulse was how I was really greedy for an experience, like in my, in my greed to have a good experience, I, I would do some of the strangest thing, like I found this very satisfying. Mm. And it, it may have linked, uh, I'm, I would probably go here. I said, you told me something about your experiences with meditation. And, uh, um, 
I might even in, try to induce that. I might even say, did you notice, was any of that part of how you were playing your notes? You know? See, and so she's feeling, you know, a wholeness about it. And all of this is about health. Now, are we dealing with the pain? Yes. We're not dealing with tissue damage. I heard someone say earlier, she doesn't focus on the pain. Of course, because where does pain take place? Up here. Same place music takes place, by the way. Music's played in the head. So, yes, we are working with the pain because it's a pain experience. Tissue damage is one part of that. Every time you've been able to, we use the word distract, or um, keep yourself from thinking about the pain, okay, that's up here. You didn't change the tissue damage. You didn't change the back part, okay? You changed how you're responding to it. So that's what this is about, encouraging different responses to, through the music what that person can learn about and learn about. And we're out of time now, but thanks a lot. Um, I think I